fire in Cocoa, Florida. Starship and Star Hopper presentation probably late July and open to local supporters. The Quiet Before the Raptor and Falcon 9 like reusable rockets in development from all major spacefaring nations. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. First of all, a little news for our community. Our very own Discord server has just gone online. You can join right now. There are special badges for patrons added to the different tiers as well. It's a Patreon exclusive Discord, but don't worry, even the $1 tier gets access. Again, loads of things have happened in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. A fire broke out at the construction site in Coco, Florida. It wasn't as bad as it seemed at first though. One of the containers, presumably the workshop with welding equipment in it, caught on fire in one corner. The local fire department was able to put it out after just 10 minutes, so there was not much damage there. Estimates range from fifty dollars to $100,000. Possible cause, faulty electrical cable. One interesting fact can be gained from this though. When the fire department gave out estimates about the damage, they mentioned a second fire, which must have happened this year and caused around $450,000 of damage. Elon, get your electricity electricity straight. Next time it might be the Starship prototype burning and we don't want to see that happen, don't we? Starship presentation to be in late July and open to local supporters. As we've expected for a while now, the Starship presentation will be after Starhopper has done its first hop. What's new though is that Elon said that it most likely will be in the end of July and that local supporters will be invited. So all those Maria Pointers, Boca Chica gals, Austin Barnards and Lab Padres, keep the end of July free in your calendar. Do not go on vacation, we need you to take pictures and do first-hand reporting on what Elon has to say about Starship. The mystery foil. Alright guys, we can stop all our speculations now. All those theories about thermal shielding and insulations and guidance markers and even methane cooling layers, they can be put aside. It is what it is. Good old boring protection foil. Elon wants Starship to be shiny, that's all. The calm before the raptor. Boca Chica has become a quiet place in the last few days. Besides the occasional polishing work on the outer hull of the Starship prototype, it's very quiet on the southern front. Almost too quiet. Raptor has arrived in Boca Chica. As you can see in the pictures provided by Lab Padre, Raptor has arrived in Boca Chica and will be installed shortly. We'll see in the next few days if Raptor SN06 does what it's really supposed to do. And I so hope it does. All major spacefaring nations are developing reusability. To the educated space fan, this doesn't come as a surprise at all. But what about it? Why have they all chosen to go down SpaceX lane by now? Reusability when it comes to orbital rockets is a fairly new thing. SpaceX has been developing reusability publicly for roughly 8 years now. How long they worked on it behind closed doors is unknown, but add another 2 years and you're on the safe side. And it all started with Grasshopper. Grasshopper was, against any rumors you might have heard, completely privately funded by SpaceX with no additional fundings from any government. It was SpaceX's first test vehicle to scout the possibility of reusable rockets with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. Falcon had its first successful flight into orbit on September 1st, 2008. But that was not meant for reusability. Two prototypes were built and launched for McGregor, Texas, where until today SpaceX maintains its main test facilities. First low altitude hover and landing tests were performed in 2012. The first Grasshopper was a 32 meter tall rudimentary test vehicle that performed 8 successful tests. Later in 2013 came the bigger Falcon 9 reusable test vehicle at 48 meters tall based on the Falcon 9 V1.1. It technically was a Falcon 9 1.1, without the upper stage and a few other things with the addition of retractable landing legs. It performed 5 flights, 4 successful flights, with the 5th flight destroying the vehicle due to a blocked sensor of which the flight version of Falcon 9 1.1 would have had a backup. The test vehicle did not have the backup sensor and thus exploded. Then came the post-mission landing tests. If you already have a rocket coming down, why not try to land it, right? Easier said than done. SpaceX equipped every Falcon 9 going up with the proper instrumentation and landing equipment to perform landing attempts on land and sea. With mixed results. SpaceX tried and tried and the competition openly mocked them for trying. But hey, at least the tests were almost for free. And then it happened. 
Falcon 9 Flight 20 with the full thrust version, an update from Falcon 9 1.1 silenced the laughter. On December 1st, in 2015, SpaceX did something the big competition thought to be impossible. A first for humanity. The Falcon unfolded its landing legs and touched down. When the smoke had settled, few realized how big of a game changer this moment was and would be from here on. SpaceX had demonstrated an orbital rocket landing on a production vehicle, not a test prototype. The rest is history. Now, almost four years later, SpaceX is dominating the launch market, routinely landing boosters and leaving behind the old and established competition faster than skeptics can write negative news. If SpaceX has done anything important in its short history, it's to prove that reusability is not a nice to have, it's here to stay. But what about it? Will SpaceX be the only competitive launch provider from here on? There's a lot of money behind the big players, and you might say they were slow to realize, but it looks like they finally got the message. All of them are actively working on prototypes, grasshoppers, for their future slice of the reusable rocket cake. So let me introduce you to the three new players when it comes down to how not to land an orbital rocket. Russia. The Russian Soyuz program presumably took the biggest hit when the Falcon landed. Pre-SpaceX, Roscosmos was the go-to partner for cheap launches to space. ULA was more expensive, thus putting the Russians into a formidable situation. When the space shuttle's STS-135 took off for the last time in 2011, Soyuz even became the only way to reach the ISS. Everything started to change though in 2015. Now, four years later, Soyuz is an outdated relic from the past. A relic with a greatly successful track record, but still outdated. Not much is known yet about the Soyuz 5 light reusable launch vehicle as Roscosmos has named their new project. Together with the S7 Airspace Corporation, they are working on the prototype and they have been for a while now. Announced in March of 2017, Soyuz 5 is planned to replace the Ukrainian-built Zenit rocket as a medium-class launch vehicle, possibly becoming the booster for a later planned super-heavy launch vehicle. Two months ago, Dmitry Rogozhin, director of Roscosmos, announced to the public that Soyuz 5 Lite is based on the Soyuz 5 concept with the big difference that it is supposed to reach the state of reusability. Scheduled for a first launch from Baikonur Cosmodrome in 2022, Soyuz 5 Lite will be Russia's most promising entry into the reusable rocket market. Up next, China. What SpaceX is for the US, Link Space is for China. Founded in early 2014, Link Space marks a change in China's approach to spaceflight similar to the one that SpaceX brought to the US. It is China's first private space company. The RLV T5 test vehicle is Link Space's grasshopper. And it's not just on paper. Back in April, it demonstrated its capabilities at that test facility in eastern China's Shandong province. And the day was rather bad for doing the first hop, as there was a 30 km per hour crosswind at the time. Nonetheless, the rocket lifted off the pad, hovered at a height of 20 meters and pinpointed the landing again at their landing pad. Which looks very similar to a certain drone ship's landing pad, just in white. Robert Zubrin, an American aerospace engineer and president of the Mars Society, who was present at the pad when the launch occurred, later said, just getting off the pad is a lot. What Link Space did was like a seven-year-old Mozart composing a symphony. When you see a seven-year-old composing a symphony, you wonder what he's going to be when he's 20. RLVT5, also known as New Line Baby, is just a prototype and a demonstrator though. The knowledge gained from these tests will be applied to its successor, New Line 1. New Line 1 is scheduled for 2020. Its two-stage design is intended to launch nanosats and microsats of up to 200 kilograms into a sun-synchronous orbit. If this plan succeeds, Link Space will go even bigger, trying to compete with SpaceX and Blue Origin. Projects like New Line 3 will even try to reuse the second stage, but that's still far in the future. Last but not least, Europe and ESA. The European Space Agency, or ESA, has been in the launch business for a long time now. Established in 1975 and headquartered in Paris, France, ESA has a worldwide staff of about 2,200 and an annual budget of about 6.4 billion US dollars. Their main workhorse, Ariane 5, has some impressive specs too. With a height of up to 52 meters and a mass of up to 777 tons, it is capable of getting over 20 tons to LEO, comparable to a Falcon 9 rocket. 
It had its maiden flight on June 4th, 1996. That was 23 years ago. The rocket has seen numerous improvements over time, but at its core, the system is getting old. Ariane Spass, ESA's rocket building contractor, has had a fight with reusability for a while now. For example, in 2018, Chief Executive Ariane Group Alain Charmeau said the following in an interview with the German Spiegel magazine. Let us say we had 10 guaranteed launches per year in Europe and we had a rocket which we can use 10 times. We would build exactly one rocket per year, he said. That makes no sense. I cannot tell my teams goodbye, see you next year. This sounds very similar to the problems NASA is facing with the Artemis program. So many jobs depend on these projects that changing anything becomes extremely difficult. Even though change is coming, also at ESA. Two weeks ago, Ariane Group announced the founding of a new department called Ariane Works. And Ariane Works is developing the launch demonstrator Callisto. Again, very similar to SpaceX's Grasshopper, will gather basic first knowledge needed for the construction of a full-scale first stage. Scheduled for 2020, Callisto is a booster capable of reaching orbit. It will be powered by the Prometheus engine, a reusable liquid oxygen and methane engine that may cost as little as 1 million to build. Callisto looks strikingly similar to a Falcon 9 rocket. Even the engine has a similar thrust output as Merlin 1D of around 100 tons. Ariane Group is not afraid of admitting that either. Jean-Marc Astog, head of the French Space Agency's launch vehicle program, said that Callisto is grasshopper and that the Chinese are building something similar right now. After Callisto, Themis is scheduled to become the successor of Ariane 6 to be released around 2025. But what about it? What does this mean for SpaceX? Will Falcon 9 become just another reusable rocket? Unlikely. SpaceX has a huge head start. They're at least six to eight years ahead of the competition. And even though they are so far ahead, they are still driving innovation as if there was nothing else important in their world. With a Starship likely flying when Themis does its first test flight, SpaceX is the leader in reusability and will be for quite some time. Remember? Falcon 9 flew three years with its landing legs attached before it managed its first landing. What's good to see though is that all major rocket building nations have acknowledged by now that reusability is the future of spaceflight. The laughter about SpaceX's seemingly futile endeavors of landing an orbital rocket have long converted into acknowledgement of success and silently growing efforts to copy what they once only had a smile for. So this again wraps up today's episode of What About It? Will the Starship presentation be this month? And who will be first in the race for second winners to the holy grail of reusability? As always, tell me in the comments. Today, I want to welcome Doris Ownbay as a new patron. Thank you for joining the cause and all the incredible support. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in making more and better content. As this gives me more time to focus on what I love doing the most to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. And an annual budget of about 6.4 RLVT5. <laughs> Pre-SpaceX. Pre-SpaceX. <laughs> Teamly landing boosters and faster and faster and faster. <laughs> Remember, Falcon 9 flew three years be before it had its landing legs attached. <laughs> with with.